The odd thing about modern furniture, at least the stuff that 90% of us buy and live with, is that no one expects it to last more than about a decade. It's not that it's badly designed, it's that it's deliberately made cheaply so that it can be sold cheaply, and both maker and buyer know this and expect it to require replacing more often than, say, the family dog. We see this already with pubs and cafes. Every so often a wanky new cafe set up by half-baked apprentice candidates will try making do with trendy IKEA-level retail furniture. It looks nice, the owner will congratulate himself on how cheap it was, and then it's reduced to matchwood within weeks. Because cafe, or especially pub use, is to a chair or a table the equivalent of one of those rolling road machines which are used to test the longevity of cars. Hundreds of elbows and asses in continual rotation, testing it to its limits. So, pub owners who know what they're doing know they have to buy solid tables. And these days, one way to do that is to buy up the tables our grandparents were given as wedding presents in the 30s, 40s and 50s. Domestic spec has become industry spec, and a table that would last 50 years of careful family use now gets an unexpected retirement of another 10 years of hard pub use, with sloppy pints slapped down onto its naked wood, whilst the ghosts of house-proud women who wouldn't put so much as a teacup on it without a saucer, coaster, table mat, tablecloth, and protective green baize undercloth look on and have the ghosts of kittens. Meanwhile, household furniture is made of MDF and hope. Which is good in that people can afford to buy furniture earlier in life, but bad in that it's wasteful of resources because it constantly needs to be replaced. It would be a better world if things lasted longer, but market forces mean that cheap furniture that doesn't last proliferates. What can we do about this? Here's an idea. What if there was a company which you had confidence would always exist and which, for a very small annual subscription, would provide you with furniture forever? The Perpetual Furniture Company, which undertakes that you will always have a nice table, and that when the table they supply stops being nice, they'll replace it with one that is. At this point, market forces apply to the company, not the customer, and it's my guess that they will find it's more cost-effective to supply you with a solid, durable table once every 40 years than a flimsy plywood and cardboard one once every seven. The key is breaking the relationship between the feckless seller and the feckless buyer. The person who will sell something ridiculously cheaply by squandering resources that are currently underpriced and employing children, and the person who will buy it at that price because, hey, it's cheap. And if it works for tables, which, by the way, I obviously know it wouldn't really, but let's go with it for three minutes, maybe it would also work for fuel. For instance, air travel is far cheaper than it is environmentally viable. The environmental cost is never factored in, in a way which is egregious and murderous. But politicians are squeamish about aligning environmental and economic costs, because it would involve making stuff that people, voters, can currently afford unaffordable. But it is unaffordable environmentally, and it has to be sorted out. So, as with the perpetual furniture company, why not harness market forces to shift the burden of the problem to the people who will benefit financially from solving it? That's what a carbon tax would do. The problem is the emission of carbon into the atmosphere. Tax that, not holidays, not fuel, but emissions. And let the people who deal with making money out of air travel work out how to continue doing so. They'll do it. They're good at it. And once that tax system is instituted, you, the politician, won't have to hug a single tree. You just have to make low emissions part of the profit incentive. Companies won't choose to do it themselves. Why should they? Their job is to make money. Your job is to protect the people who elected you even if those people also want to go to Portugal for a fiver. Market forces are, as we all know, incredibly powerful. But politicians have the ability to push them in the direction that's most useful. Like keeping a vicious Rottweiler as a guard dog, rather than allowing it to chase you around your house, corner you in the cellar, and ultimately bite your head off.